what's up bikers episode 181 i feel like i should really sit down and think about and an, a serious like a big boy intro one of these days maybe i'll even make something we can just play it and then boom there you go <laughs> but instead you get to hear me tell you the episode number every time Hopefully I figure out something before we're like 1,357. Welcome to this show. Anyways, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Sage Titanium Bicycles or uh, better yet, the guy named Dave that I'm assuming is the owner, the founder. We're going to find out exactly who he is. But anyways, before we get started, um, let's talk about a couple of sponsors that I have that I'm really stoked about, you know. It's not every day some fat guy that makes mediocre YouTube content gets to be sponsored by some bike company. So check this out. I am going to be riding a Delano Peak this year, and I can't remember if I talked to you guys about it here or on the backpedal show. But one way or another, I um, I have been flip-flopping back and forth and back and forth on what color to get, whether or not I should get this blue or whether or not I should get this pink. And in the back of my mind, I really want to get the pink. And I was looking for some validation. And the other day on the backpedal show, unanim unanimously, there you go. It seemed like it was a, it was a go for the pink. So anyways, you'll be seeing some content on that on the biker channel. If you, uh, if you want to subscribe over there, that'd be rad. If you're thinking about getting a bike, this is a, a, a shorter travel. I wouldn't call it a short travel. It's a, it's a trail bike. A 150, 135, 29er. So it's going to have a little more suspension than my tall boy did, which is probably a good thing. Um, so if you're thinking about it, go check it out. And check this out. Oddly enough, Tasco has these chalk pink gloves that are damn close in color. So maybe this is my sign. <laughs> if you're thinking about picking some, some gloves up, head over to Tasco, man. Really enjoying their stuff. I like this uh, this weight glove for this time of year, but definitely go to the uh, lighter weight ones in the summertime. But anyways, yeah. Use code BIKER, B1KER, save a little money. Aside from that, those of you that... Um, can do me a favor and you're on Instagram and you, you want to go over there and give me a follow. I always like seeing those numbers rise as well as if you're listening on YouTube and you hit subscribe, it doesn't really do anything for the algorithm nowadays, but it sure makes me feel good about myself. And one of these days I'm going to get one of them silver plaques and then um, I'm just going to quit. So <laughs> maybe that's you guys' plan is don't subscribe. So I don't quit. That's, that's actually, man, I'm going to stop saying that. Anyways, I appreciate everybody out there that's on members or uh, Patreon. It really means a lot. There's some extra content on um, on members. You can you can catch that backpedal show and the, the back episodes as well as early releases. Same thing goes with Patreon. And a while ago, I took a lot of my content off of YouTube that was like some of my earlier stuff where I like to drop the F-bomb like every four or five seconds. And so I figured that wasn't so good anymore and my content I, I didn't think it was as as high quality as what i'm doing now so i didn't want people to find the channel from one of those videos and then be like this dude sucks so anyways if you're on patreon um you can still see all those things so those of you guys that are maybe new to the channels so you want to see some some older content there you go anyways we're gonna bring dave on talk about bikes enough talk about me how's it going dave hey it's good how are you doing Dude, here we are, man. Another another episode. I can't believe I'm almost at 200 episodes. It's like that's crazy. I, honestly, that's I so started wild. this because I I wanted to listen to a podcast that was like this, and there wasn't one. I really wasn't planning on doing this for a couple of years, but here we are. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing how many people I hear in similar. Um, circumstances whether it was i was i was at a shop yesterday there's a there's a local shop here in uh near where i live in in outside of the portland area uh called the urban wheeler and uh -huh. he's like a hardcore mountain bike shop like the the vibe i got from him was um the first time i walked in was this shop belongs in canada like you could find it in whistler it's got like trail building tools it's got you know he's got like the the non big brand bikes kind of thing uh -huh. like you know he was carrying like orange and nuke proof and intense and just you right. know like hardcore bikes and it was like the vibe was so cool and his comment was there was no other shop in portland that was doing this uh mm -hmm. kind of thing and so i started the shop because that's what i wanted and 
that's kind of how I started Sage because there wasn't anybody doing what I wanted. And that's why you started this channel because there was nobody else doing what you wanted. So it's, yeah. it's, it's th those are the most organic ways to get these things to go. And it's just, that's awesome to hear that. That's why you started it. Yeah. Where are you at outside of Portland? Uh, the suburbs. Uh, it's called Beaverton. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I know where that is. Yeah. So it's about 10, you know, like 10 miles outside kind of thing, you know, quick, yeah, quick yeah. Battle of the town, not a big deal. So. When I was in high school, I went up to Longview, Washington with a friend of oh, mine yeah. to, to sure. visit his grandmother, right? Yeah. And we went up there for like a week and like we were hiking around Mount St. Helens and just doing high school shit, right? Sure. And uh, uh, when I left, I was like, man, it's the last time I'm ever going to see this city. And then fast forward yeah. like 15 years in my life and the, the my, my ex-wife her her parents lived up there and then i ended up going up there like once a year for like years i was like this is crazy in so longview or, or yeah Florida. in longview yeah 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 in yeah so, small town too it's not like yeah not, well when when her and i got together they lived in the bay area and somehow they had some family that lived up there so like they were getting closer yeah. to retiring and they moved up there and it was like this is crazy like how does this even happen so i ended up what i would do is i would go up and the company I worked for had an office in Portland. Mm -hmm. And so I was it something with a T Twalent? No, something Twalent. just yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh I would like drop the kids off at the in-laws and then go ride bikes for a week and work in Portland. So I was yeah. ended up riding there a bunch. It was, it's it's fun, fun area. It is. It's definitely a good time. Yeah, yeah. I did some some riding in the what like over the state line there like towards mount st helens up that way and i rode some stuff uh something out toward like you're heading towards the coast from from portland it's like a a like an ohv kind of atv park bear or something or something oh, like uh brown's camp yeah that, that was, was it yeah. yeah that was that was actually when i first so i've been living out in portland i moved out here from new york i was mm -hmm. born and raised in new york city oh fellow east coaster yeah, oh yeah, yeah, hardcore. <laughs> um, and uh, I moved out here in December of '02, so I've uh -huh. been here for uh, 22 years at this point. Mm -hmm. So you know, fair amount of time. And yeah. uh, some of the first mountain bike trails that I went to were Browns Camp kind of thing, yeah. and that was coming from the East Coast. Going to going to Browns Camp blew my mind because you had these massive trees that were just and the dirt was brown and it was yeah. like it was like hero dirt kind of thing it wasn't that i mean i love east coast riding don't get me wrong and and i i certainly you know learned how to you know everything from roots and rocks and just nasty stuff but there's something about west coast dirt that's just yeah. if you haven't experienced it it's one of those things that like blows your yeah. mind and it was fantastic and yeah so brown's camp was that was a mainstay for a lot of years. Luckily, we built a lot of trails since then, so there's some amazing stuff out here now. Right on, man. I'll have to come up and ride Portland again sometime here in the near oh, future. Sure. Every time I go to to Oregon now, I have a friend that lives in Bend, so we end up going up there. And then, yeah, I think earlier this year I went, or last year I went up to Ashland. That was pretty cool. So, yeah, I I haven't ridden that Oak Ridge area yet, though. That looks like super fun. Oak Ridge is fun. Um, there is um, uh, there's a a bike tour group uh, down there, um, and they'll do they'll shuttle you up and take you up the runs, and then you could just bomb them down. And there was I don't know if they're still doing it, but there was a ride that you could do a, a day. You can get thirty thousand feet of descending in one day. Um, Jesus. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you burn brake pads. Like if you're doing a like uh, there was a. a um, Oh God, what was it called? There used to be a a, a mountain bike festival that was there. In yeah, it was like Mountain Bike Oregon or something yeah, like that. that, that. MBO. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, if you were there for the weekend, it was recommended you would bring an extra set of brake pads if you were using your own bike, kind of. Thing. Wow. Because it was just you, just descending and descending and descending, kind of thing. So it's fun. Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge has some really good stuff. It's beautiful. So are they just like rippers? They're like super fast runs, or is it like big, long, like 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 Downeyville, for example, is like four or five thousand feet of descending, but it's over, I don't know, thirteen miles or so. So it's like 
Uh, it's yeah. a little, it's a, it's a good mix in Oak Ridge. I mean, there's definitely some long ones for sure. Um, mm -hmm. that just, and it's a lot of natural built, you know, hand built terrain rather than mm -hmm. machine built stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. not so much burnt. And I haven't been there in a few years. So if it's entirely possible, they've built more machine built stuff or put more features in, but, um, last I remember it was more natural built terrain that was using really the contours that, cause you're just the contours of the land. Cause you're just in these just giant canyons. Of, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Stuff. I like the natural built stuff better. Yeah. Really. Oh, natural built stuff is just so much fun. But yeah, you start out and like, every time I go to a, a bike park, I'm like, yeah, this is where I go once a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Bike parks have their place. So. Yeah, and I totally understand like the people that really get into it and like why. Mm -hmm. And I definitely feel like by the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I really feel like I up my skills on some things, you know? Right. So I can I can understand the draw, but for me, there like mountain biking is really it's the adventure part that I really enjoy. And and I like as much as I like bitching about climbing, like I actually like that, like, hey, I conquered this freaking suffer fest today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. We've all, we've all been there. There, yeah. there's some fantastic riding that type of terrain. There's fantastic riding out in uh hood river and, uh -huh. uh, and now, and now going towards out, uh, towards Mount hood. Uh, a yeah. lot of natural stuff out there and some just really good stuff. And then you're kind of not too far away from town. So it's just yeah. you get in, get a pint of beer afterwards, good burger, that sort of thing. Right on. Yeah. That's rad. So yeah. what got you into bikes, man? How'd you get, how'd you get started into mountain biking? Oh God. Well, uh, so I've been mountain biking since, um, the mid eighties, I suppose. So, you know, it, it's been a while for sure. Um, you know, mountain biking kind of came out when I was still pretty young, uh, kind of thing. And, you know, it just, I just got into it. I always loved growing up in New York city. We didn't really have mountains, so there wasn't really, terrain for that sort of stuff so i had a little bmx bike and i just loved playing in the dirt so it yeah just, when mountain bikes came out it just became the natural extension of like oh i can go out and go do something a little bit bigger and i love the adventure of it and i love getting out into nature and just mm -hmm. you know again just growing up in the city it's like it's a concrete jungle so the idea of going out to new jersey or connecticut or you know, uh, Pennsylvania, and you're in like, you know, places where there's, you know, these parks, these giant, you know, state parks and stuff like that, where it's, you know, trees and creeks and, you know, ponds and, and lakes and that sort of stuff was just amazing to me. So um, yeah. it really just fueled the passion of it. And then I just, I just fell in love with it. It was just one of those, you know, we, we all get bit by the bug at some point. So yeah, that was, yeah, that was right. what got me. I just, I stuck with it. And for everything I've done over the years, it always comes back to, I realize it's just, I love the dirt. I love dirt focused yeah. bike. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I, I know I, I have similar stories. So um, did you grow up like wanting to be in the bike industry or did you like go do something else completely different for a while before you got to where you're at now or. Yeah, no, I was totally, I, I didn't think I would ever be in the bike industry. Um, mm -hmm. I was prior to the, the bike industry. Um, I did, I did some it work, um, network engineering, that sort of stuff. I worked retail for a lot of years, you know, college job out of college, that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. And then worked my way up through management, that sort of thing. And, um, I eventually, when I moved out to Oregon, um, I, uh, I actually got a job at Nike. And, mm -hmm. um, so I was working, um, uh, I was working in the I, first job I could get at Nike was in the employee store here. So I got a manager job there and eventually was able to get promoted onto campus. And so I became a, an analyst, uh, at Nike. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for a number of years. And, um, uh, unfortunately the, the recession in 09, Nike did a, a mass layoff. So mm -hmm. I got laid off with a lot of other people and, um, it was actually the best thing that could have happened to me because it, 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 they, they gave me the ability to sit back and go, okay, what's really important to me kind of thing. And so yeah. with that, I really kind of sat back and looked at my career 
up until that point and realized like I want to do something for me and I want to do something that was fun. And what did I love? I love the bike industry and I know sales and, you know, and that sort of thing. And I had always been a bike nerd up until that point, you know, pre-internet mm -hmm. days, I was the guy who would, you know, get the magazines and, and pour over them and just, you know, study every detail of the race bikes and of this and that, and just really just nerd out on that stuff. And yeah. I loved it. So when this happened with me at Nike, it really gave me the opportunity to go, okay, you know what, let me take a step back and do something that I want to do. And so I reached out to a company that I had a connection at and they offered me a job doing sales and marketing um, uh, for this product. It was an internally geared hub. Uh, so talk about a, a niche product within, right. you know, cycling's already niche within, you know, the U S versus Europe kind of thing. But this was, this was already more niche. And so I started going around to bike shops and uh, going to events and just talking about the product. And it really just kind of got me, jazzed about the bike industry you know i got to yeah. i got to meet people and it was just it was so much fun and i was just like yeah this is my this is my tribe so yeah yeah, yeah it's funny how things like getting laid off or whatever at the time they definitely feel like oh man this sucks yeah but almost everybody that i've talked to and this is my own experience as well i got laid off from from at&t at one point and uh it was definitely a gift course. Like almost everybody I talked to when they look back, they're like, you know what? That was awesome. That was actually like, it turned me in this direction or did yeah. that for me. And uh, it's interesting to hear, hear the same story with you as well. So that's really cool, man. Yeah. You, I mean, yeah. Sorry, go on. Go ahead. Oh, it was, I, I could have seen myself. My thought was I was going to retire with Nike. Like, yeah, I, yeah. No desire to leave whatsoever. And it was, this was just the perfect opportunity to go wake up you know you need yeah. to you need to you know kind of be out there and and do something for yourself and yeah so, yeah no it worked out great i'm I'm super happy with it and so i do this full time now and so it's yeah been so you went where how did you get from from doing internal gear internally geared hubs to like you know what I feel like I'm going to go ahead and try to saturate the market with another bike brand. <laughs> yeah. um, so wait a minute. Wait, you, you were like, Hey, this is a niche product. Why don't I get really niche with bikes? <laughs> yeah, that anyway. was, that was, that was definitely, that was definitely the, the thought process. Uh, of <laughs> like, how can I, you know, I was already in this really fine little bucket. How can I make it smaller? And, right. But then I can own that little fine bucket. That was kind right. of, the, I was like, all right, how can I actually take over here? <laughs> um, no, it was, uh, I was, while I was doing, um, while I was doing uh, the, um, the internally geared hub, I was just kind of, I, I was honestly, I got tired of, I'd always, okay, let me back up. When I was living in New York, I always, I, I loved titanium bikes. I right. was, I never could afford one kind of thing. I was too young and and they're just super expensive and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But when I would see a, a titanium bike ride by, that was just like, oh, wow, look at that. Like that's on the space shuttle kind of thing. Like it was yeah, that yeah. kind of cool stuff. And so yeah. I always had this love affair with titanium. As you know, when I moved out to Oregon, by that point, carbon had become, you know, the norm and everybody was buying carbon bikes and that sort of stuff. My first carbon road bike was a giant TCR SL zero or something like that kind of thing. Like it was a nice race bike and it was stiff and it light and it just whew, shot forward. Yeah. Like it was, it was awesome. And I, you know, one thing would lead to another and I would get a new bike you know, a year later or another year later or whatever it was. And you kind of just start getting into the cycle of recycling the carbon, not recycling. You're just, you're, you're trading in for the new bike kind of thing. I yeah. wouldn't say I was recycling the old one other than I was selling it to somebody else. So you're just kind of yeah. passing it down the road. Yeah. hundred percent. And so it got to the point where I was my last, my last couple of bikes were, um, I was riding some uh, S-Works Tarmax uh, as my road bike at the time. And um, I remember specifically, I got like the, the you know, the SL2 had come out and they came out with like this limited edition black and white paint job. 
And so I went in and I got that because I was kind of due for a new one or whatever. And I got it and I showed up at the group ride and everybody was like, ooh, ah, and all that sort of stuff. And you feel like the new kid on the block. And then, and it was this limited edition. And then three weeks later, there was another limited edition that came out. And then next thing you know, somebody else is showing up with that and it's the exact same bike, but it's a different paint job. And you're, everybody is just like, at some point, you're, I realized my bike was not special anymore. And it just didn't have the soul of, of, because it, it was just, they were just being just churned out like that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, going back to like the 80s and 90s, the old Colnagos, Pinarellos, uh, Bianchis, and, you know, even the US made stuff, um, you know, from other brands, even Schwinn Paramounts and that sort of thing. Obviously, clearly talking about road bikes, there was a soul to those bikes. There was something mm -hmm. about those bikes that you held on to it. And it was a piece of, there was a piece of heritage there. There was a piece of legacy there that yeah. someone made with their own two hands versus yeah. carbon things that were getting stamped down a mold. Now, don't get me wrong. I carbon bikes are awesome and they yeah. serve a, a great purpose. And I got, you know, I've had plenty of carbon bikes over the years kind of thing. I don't mm -hmm. own any currently uh, for obvious reasons. Um, right. <laughs> um, I do have one alloy bike and one steel bike that are not Sage uh, bikes, both mountain bikes. And, you know, we, you can ask me about that later if you want. Um, but um, I just felt like at some point I the carbon bikes just didn't have a soul to them. And I, I kind of I was looking around and I was and I at that point I had made enough contacts within the industry. I knew where to order stuff from and that sort of thing. And I was like, I think I could do this. And nobody's mm -hmm. doing titanium or very few people were doing titanium. And so I was like, I, mm -hmm. I think I could do this. And so started reaching out to a few different people. One thing leads to another. And next thing you know, it's like, hey, we've got a design. You got to think of a name for this. And so, you know, that's how it just kind of it just started and snowballed from there. How'd you come up with the name? Oh, that's a funny one. Uh, so naming naming a bike model is hard. Naming a brand is <laughs> oh, that's just I don't I don't like that. It's torture. Um, everybody, I mul multiple friends, family members, everybody was giving me uh, suggestions like they're throwing out, you know, people are giving me lists. Oh, I thought of these five things. Or what about this? Or what about that? Yeah. And you're trying to think of something that you know, it got to the point that you're, you know, you're looking around going, what about, you know, phone bikes or, you know, M&M bikes or, you know, or <laughs> bottle of water bikes. Like you're just looking at stuff randomly. Yeah, and, yeah. and so sure enough, as far as Sage goes, um, uh, my wife uh, had was doing the same thing and she was in the fridge one morning. I, I was eating breakfast. I'm in the kitchen. She's in the fridge and looking around. And she's like, what about milk bikes, orange juice bikes, Sage bikes? banana bikes, carrot bikes, like she's just going through everything. And she said Sage. So I give her credit for that. Uh -huh. Three weeks later, another friend, but she was thinking because she saw the the herb or whatever, yeah. you know, the bottle of it, you know, Sage, oregano bikes. Like she was, I think she was in the spice rack rather than the fridge. Yeah. And um, uh, a couple of weeks later, another friend of mine said Sage as well. But he was doing it from a color perspective. He was like, what about Got blue it. bikes, green bikes, sage bikes? And, you know, yeah. so they both said sage, but she said it, it was in relation to the spice. He said it in relation to the color. And because it was said that second time, it stuck with me. And my thought was, wait, sage wisdom, sage advice, say a sage person. This is your, it's your, I'm saying you're smart. Like it's a, mm -hmm. this is a smart decision. This is a there is a reason behind this. Like, why are you doing this? You're making a titanium bike because it's going to last for 30 years or forever kind of thing. It's, you know, the ride quality is there kind of thing. It's There's all these positive things. Like, these are smart decisions. This is a sage choice. Kind yeah. Of. You're, yeah. It, it just all clicked. And I was like, oh. and so. Sage. There you go. Oh, yeah. So it, And then yeah. luckily it wasn't taken, right? <laughs> you know? oh. God. Yeah. Then yeah, you got to go through the whole trademark process, kind of thing. Yeah. So luckily, it wasn't taken. Yeah. So, God forbid enough, you're looking for other, a domain name then too, right? <laughs> yeah. The there was somebody. There was a bike shop in Texas that had SageCycles.com, and uh -huh. um, they apparently 
went out of business and were stiffing people on their orders. And there so when I started Sage, I couldn't obviously take that domain name. And they emailed me. They're like, hey, you can buy it for you know a lot of money. And I was like, right, no. yeah, $30,000 will sell you this domain name. That means- Yeah, that. which has a bad <laughs> reputation attached to it. Like, <laughs> no, thank you. And so um, so I made, I came up with, I had a different domain name. It was like sage dash cycles, I think, dot com. So I put a yeah. dash in there or something to separate it. And I started getting all these nasty phone calls from people going, I ordered this, you know, these wheels and this XT derailleur and this handlebar or whatever, and you haven't shipped anything. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. So, time out. Not Maybe this, this stage time. thing's not such a great idea. Yeah, no, I was like, no, 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 not me. Look, the calls have stopped since then and the, the other guy's long out of business. So it's not a worry anymore, but it really was. <laughs> it was kind of funny in the beginning. And, and all I could do was just like, I'm really sorry. Like, I'd love to help you, but I can't. I'm not the same guy. And when people realized that they were all, everybody was nice about it, but it was, it was kind of funny in the beginning. So yeah, yeah, it, sounds like it. <laughs> it was like, yeah, domain names and brand names are, are tough to find. And yeah. So did like, when you started, it was probably like, I'm going to build a bike for myself and then I'm going to try to sell it to other people. I'm assuming something along those lines or yeah, you're like, yeah, 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 it was, um, it's always been a matter of, so I've been riding and racing bikes for, you know, like I said, mountain bikes going back to the eighties. Like my first mountain bike race was in the eighties. I was a teenager up in Vermont somewhere and mm -hmm. I've just been racing ever since. And so I, I know what I like as far as from a performance perspective kind of thing. And, you know, I, I'm never going to, you know, I never turned professional or anything like that, but I just, I, I can relate to what is a well, a good performing bike and, and how right. I want the bike to ride. So I've always built the, the, the prototypes and the designs are always, are always for me first so that, you know, okay, well, how does this bike ride? And, you know, what do I want to, what do I want to make? What do I want to ride? Because I'm hoping then if it's something I want to ride, it's something you'll want to ride as well. Yeah. Maybe I'm finding like there's a hole in the market kind of thing, you know, like yeah. you started off with the, the channel. There wasn't yeah. anything that was out there. So similar concept. Yeah. Yeah. So um, are you a welder or did you know somebody or you're like, I'm just going to figure no. out my, my, uh, my, my schematics and have somebody else do it. How, how do you, how do you cross that bridge? Yeah, I, I, I made the choice early on that uh, I've never picked up a welding torch. Freely admit that. Um, I made the choice early on that I would work with people who were far more experienced and way better at what they do than what I would ever be. Because if I wanted to learn how to weld and hats off to everybody who does it, but if I wanted to learn how to weld and I wanted to get this business up and running with everything else that needs to go on from marketing to design to customer service and all that sort of stuff, I was going to I was either going to build too few frames in the beginning and you know, you'd eventually have to expand and pass off stuff because this is my vision for the company uh, or you have to bring in other people to do other stuff. And it's still, you know, there's I had to take a step back from everything. Yeah. Go, okay, well, what's going to be, what's more important for me? And for my, my time as an analyst at Nike, I looked at, I looked at everything that was in front of me from a supply chain perspective and was like, okay, I can, I know how to run this kind of thing. Yeah. Like, so that was, that was where my strength lied. So I, I try, I work with people that are strong with what they do and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, it, it's worked out well in that regard. So when you're first starting out, do you like, just find some local place or did you have some kind of connections with like somebody overseas or like, how did you, how did you like bring your first model to market? The first model to market. So I reached out to a local builder uh, mm -hmm. here in the Portland area um, in the very beginning and uh, asked him if he could help. Cause I didn't know anything about bike design uh, mm -hmm. in terms of angles and geometries and, you know, I know what a road bike looks like. I know what a mountain bike looks like. But if you start getting into the numbers and reach and stack and, you know, effective top tube and, you know, all that sort of stuff, like, you know, that was at the time it was game over. I've come a long way since then. But yeah, um, in, in the beginning, I didn't know any of it. So I reached out to a local builder with the idea of, hey, can you 
can you design these bikes for me? This is what I want them to do. And so he said, sure. And the very first year of business, we actually, he had a contact of a factory in uh, China. And mm -hmm. so the very first year of bikes of Sage were all made in China. And so mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the idea was it was great, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, you're getting these low cost bikes and, you know, they're, they're making them and supposedly they were good quality and, and that sort of thing. But the, the reality is, is that, you know, there's, there's good factories and there's bad factories and that's anywhere, mm -hmm. you know, and that sort of thing. And so the prototypes yeah. that we got were all good. And the first batch of frames we got were good, but the second batch got a little worse and the third batch yeah. got really bad kind of thing. And it was just like, after that, I was like, no, I can't do this anymore. And so um, I stopped that and made the decision to switch to Made in USA in 2014, because uh -huh. I started uh -huh. started the company in 2012, first frames were 2013. So 2014 was Made in USA. And then I've been Made in USA ever since. Um, right on. So, you know, that that's been great. Um, but, you know, it's at some point you got to kind of look at the scale of the scale of things. And, you know, it's 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 interesting. You know, it's um, you know, there, there's great stuff that comes out of China. iPhones, you know, yeah. kind of thing. you know, it's you, you get good stuff that comes out and you get bad stuff that comes out. It just depends on where you go. And so it's finding the right partners. And now that I've been in this 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 side of things a little bit more, I've gotten to expand my knowledge base of who can do what and that sort of thing. And there are great partners over in Asia and, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of, and the stuff is handmade over there. So it's not a bad thing in that regard. So it's yeah, just, kind yeah. of, it kind of depends on what you're looking for and that sort of stuff. But yeah. So what was the, what was the first thing that, that you brought out? Just like a, like a hardtail? No, no, no a bike or... little while. No, the, the very first bike um, I had, three bikes in the beginning it was a cyclocross bike a road bike and then kind of a precursor to a gravel bike mm -hmm. uh, drop bar bike with bigger tire clearance but the geometry was a little different than a cross bike and those were the first three models out of china and then the and then the first three models here in the u.s and it took probably about 2017 so probably about three years, two and a half years or so for me to kind of settle in on what was going to be my first mountain bike. Um, for some reason, that just really kind of hung up on me for a bit because on one level, I really loved longer travel bikes and longer travel hardtails and just kind of, you know, especially Pacific Northwest here kind of thing. It's, you know, we've got steep stuff and you know, mm -hmm. I love cross country. That's what I grew up on. And so, but I felt like there was this push and this trend towards these longer travel bikes. And so I felt like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of where I want to go. So I, I came out with my first mountain bike was my flow motion, which mm -hmm. is a 150 mil hardtail. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, and that's, that was doing well and people were liking that and that was doing real, really well. And then I got a request uh, from a customer about a year or so later for a, um, a cross country bike. And I was like, ah, oh, you know what, this would actually be kind of fun to do. Cause I gotta, I have to do the research on it anyway, as far as figuring out what the geometry is going to be and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I, uh, you know, came up with the concept of doing a world cup style cross country bike, like rather than like, it's just going to be like a normal, I'm like, no, 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 let's, make it a world cup bike like same sort of race ready like that's what it is yeah just came out with that bike and the guy loved it so much that i you know i built one for myself as well and and i loved it so much i was like oh my god and i was like okay this is a model so that, yeah. that became the optimator so now i had a 100 mil travel bike and i had a 150 so i needed to make a goldilocks bike and so that became the power line of the 130 travel and that's just that bike's just a ripper as well too. So it's just kind of, yeah, that's where it's, things have landed. It's kind of funny. Yeah. So similar to you, whenever you were first looking at titanium, just look, you know, you're like, that just looks rad, you know? And, uh, I had a, a similar experience. Like I never really knew why titanium bikes were sought after. Like I never actually had a conversation with somebody and was like, why do you choose a titanium bike? You know what I mean? Sure. But it was like, I, I had met somebody and 
they had they had a, a titanium gravel bike and i just remember looking at it and was like man that thing just looks really cool like yeah. timeless cool you know what i mean like yeah. like delorean cool you know it's like oh, this thing sure. just looks rad you yeah. know and and that's about where i packed it up in my head and just left it there you know and and later on down the road i got into like like uh roadish gravel kind of stuff and huh. i kept thinking man if I could have any bike to ride, like in this kind of stuff, it would definitely be a titanium bike, but zero idea of mm. how it rides or anything just sure. because like, it just looks fucking cool, man. You know? Yeah. So, um, when I first, I have a titanium gravel bike now and, um, what are you riding? I, I have a, a black heart. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's the, uh, actually it's like the all road bike. So it's, okay. it's perfect for, for what I do. Cause like, I like yeah. to say that I ride gravel, but mostly I'm riding road sure. and there's like these occasional spots where it's like, Oh sweet. Look at this, you know? Yeah. And, uh, um, realistically though, I'm, I'm a mountain biker and, and when I'm riding gravel or road, it's, it's just to like get exercise out my front door instead of, you know, <laughs> on a train but when I first started riding that bike, it really like, there's some things that really blew me away. And I, I, like I said, I had zero expectation of what a Thai bike was. Sure. So for people that don't know or haven't ridden a Thai bike, like how would you explain that, that characteristic of why they should consider a titanium bike? So, um, the, so titanium back in the nineties, um used to use very thin walled tubing and mm -hmm. smaller diameter tubing wall thickness was thin. the just the general the, the the od of the tube the outer diameter of the tube was generally smaller kind of thing than what they mm -hmm. are now they're they're bigger now and they're a lot smaller back then um and uh those bikes for lack of a better term, uh, rode like what was called a wet noodle. Like you could just put the power down on the cranks and the bottom bracket would kind of swing around like this kind of thing on mm -hmm. you. And it just, they, they, titanium bikes were plush and compliant, but maybe not necessarily for the right reasons back then. Yeah. The modern titanium bikes now, you know, the, the tubing diameters that we're using, we're using thicker wall, uh, thicker wall diameters. Um, and then the, the outer diameters of the tubes themselves are actually bigger. So as a result, the bikes generally are stiffer, but titanium has from a, there's a thing called fatigue resistance, which is basically you can take a, uh, a tie tube, um, and you can, sorry, tie tube with the Sage logo. There we go. Mm -hmm. Um, you can, you can take a, uh, you could take a tube and you can, if you bend it, well, this doesn't bend. Um, so not the best example, but, uh, <laughs> so, I get it. Yeah. If you can, you can take a, a steel tube and you can bend it to a point and it'll break. You can take mm -hmm. an aluminum tube and it won't bend as far. It breaks that much faster. Um, a tie tube, you can bend all the way relatively speaking kind of thing and then it'll break kind of thing so titanium has what's called a higher fatigue high fatigue resistance meaning it, it breaks it, it'll it takes more for it to break so as a result the ride of the bike is much more lively it it absorbs mm -hmm. the road vibrations better than does aluminum it's similar to steel but there's just something about it that smooths it out just that little bit more kind of thing and so the ride quality is such that when you're on uh, chip seal is probably the best the best surface to really feel the difference of it. You can feel it on gravel, but sometimes you get really bounced around on gravel and yeah, certainly on dirt. But chip seal uh, pavement kind of thing, you get that road buzz uh, on a carbon bike. It may transmit right through, and you just you feel every single little you know piece there. The aluminum bike maybe it's a little bit better. Steel bike's going to be better for sure. But a tie bike, it just smooths it out that it's just like, oh, yeah, it's you don't even really notice you're on chip seal kind of thing. Yeah, it just it totally smooths it out. And it's just it's 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 a unique ride quality that it it's it's tough to explain. But at the same time, it's not. It's one of those you yeah. definitely need to try it. And there's a yeah. lot of, you know, a lot of customers of mine just for them. There's been quite a few. It's a leap of faith. Yeah. 
same sort of thing. They've, you know, like you, they've, they've heard great things about titanium, but they've never ridden it. And it's, so it's just, they're taking that leap of faith of, okay, is this everything it's cracked up to be? And, and I sit there and go, it is, I promise, Yeah. you know, and then they get it and they're like, it is, it really is. And you know, yeah, everybody's yeah, it's, uh, also a, a, a stronger metal, right? So you can be a little bit thinner so you can shave some weight that way and still have the strength. Is that accurate? You can, I think up to a certain point though, it's, you're really kind of splitting hairs. Like I don't, I don't use, I use straight gauge tubing for all of the bikes kind of thing. I'm not mm -hmm. using any butted tubing kind of thing. And that's the butted tubing shaves a little bit of weight kind of thing. And it does give the ride a little bit more compliance kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I tend to personally leave from a design perspective I like having a stiffer frame so that mm -hmm. when you put the power down on the pedals, the response from the bike is that much quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you really want to get it, things to be a little bit more compliant kind of thing, you could take a little bit of air pressure out of your tires. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so you, but you still get that responsive frame. I think if you, and this is just my, my personal philosophy, if you take too much out of the frame and it becomes too soft kind of thing, mm -hmm. Uh, then you run the risk of it's, you know, it may not be as stiff at, at other points when you, when you want it kind of thing. Yeah. I think what I was saying was like, in terms of like, it's going to be lighter than an aluminum bike, even though it's a heavier metal. Uh, they're close. They're, yeah. they're pretty darn, they're, they're pretty darn close. It it's, I don't think it's too far off. I think you could make it lighter if you really wanted to. There is mm -hmm. also light aluminum bikes. I think it's, they're, they're pretty close. I mean, it's, yeah. It's not enough to be, I it's don't know. It's negligible. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. it's a pound at the most, it's like, yeah. it's only 454 grams. It's not, it's not yeah. really a lot. Like, you know, I can, I can cut out one donut a week and, uh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be okay there. Kind of so thing. what about in terms of weight compared to like carbon? Are they similar or? Carbon's generally going to be lighter. Like it's just, yeah. I can't compete, you know, with, with carbon in that regard. And it's just, and that's fine. Carbon yeah. go do your thing, you know, and yeah. that sort of stuff. And and that's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Carbon can be engineered to be super stiff and super strong in specific Areas. directions and uses for how the fibers are laid down and how they're woven together and how they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're bonded together and that sort of thing. And so you can make it really light and really strong in certain places because, or you can overbuild it in others and you can make it, you know, thinner over here and just, there's a lot of a lot of stuff you can do with carbon that you can't really do with titanium because realistically you're dealing with you know tubing and yeah. as a as a structure a tube is you don't get much stronger than this you know a round tube is that is that is pretty much as strong a structure as you can get I'm trying to zoom there yeah. on the camera um, so <laughs> the people know, listening are really appreciated. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I listen to podcasts all the time and I realize I'm doing that now. And you realize <laughs> people are doing that. They're like, Oh, look at my hand signals. And it's like, no, I can't see it. That's <laughs> all right. I'm just teasing you, man. Sorry. It's Sorry for everybody listening. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, in general, you know, their carbon is going to be lighter, but is the mm -hmm. ride quality going to be better? Yeah. That's that's where it boils down to certain applications. I think carbon is fantastic. No question. You know, yeah. um, I had a carbon bike before I got my, um, my new bike and I don't know if it's just the difference of the metal or the actual bike geometry or whatever. But one of the things I noticed the most was like how responsive my tie bike is. Like when I, I feel like when I pedal, it just feels like all of my energy is going through the, yeah. to the wheels you know and, and like that's the best way that i can explain it that's it's not necessarily like a some kind of mathematical thing where i was like yeah i just got on the bike beat all my prs you know it's just like it just right. feels like like i get that same kind of feeling if i ride a hardtail after riding my full suspension bike where it's just like right. every time you push the pedal down you're like holy shit man like it's all that energy is going there it, it's a snappy acceleration. It's, it's, yeah. it's lively. It's springy. It's, that's one thing I noticed, like when I would do, uh, when I was still riding a carbon bike, I would notice if you put the power down on the pedals, it was instantaneous forward momentum. 
the tie bike on the other hand when you put the power down into the pedals it's almost like it winds up on you but then mm -hmm. it just unleashes all this power going forward and when it unleashes that power it's just like you can just keep going and hold that speed for longer which yeah, I, yeah it's there there's definitely there is something about it that is unique uh yeah air to carbon for sure yeah i am um, and it's also interesting what you were saying about like I don't know, it's lack of better words, like the heritage of the older bikes and how you're like, oh, people wanted to keep those and stuff. And and in my mind, it's like, yeah, like I don't really have any reason that I would want to get another bike, you know, like, yeah. like it's kind of like, yeah, it's a little more expensive, but um, I think like it's timeless. Like you could put stickers on it. You could wrap it if you really wanted to change the color or you could just leave yeah. it the way it is and like never worry about it like getting scratched up or whatever or, like it's just um i don't know it's a super clean looking bike and um i guess the only thing that would ever make you want to change is like maybe you know all the standards change or something it's like yep never can get a can't get a headset anymore you know or something like that but yeah like, yeah i mean you know, tires are long gone at this point like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah but, uh, go ahead yeah you can't you know I, I actually just had this conversation with someone where you know, they were looking at a, you know, an S-Works uh, Athos carbon road bike, Durace, DI2, the whole nine yards kind of thing, 15 grand for that. And they're comparing it to a Sage. And my response was, well, how long do you figure you're going to keep the Athos for? And he yeah. goes, well, probably just a few years, and, you know, and then it'll sell it and get something new kind of thing because the latest and greatest will come out. I said, all right, so you're going to sell that and, you know, maybe you sell it for half price, but then you're buying another $15,000 bike. So how much more have you put into this at this point? Whereas yeah. with a tie bike, you know, in a Sage or a Blackheart or, you know, any of the other boutique brands that are out there, you're going to buy this. And to your point, maybe you're just going to change the drivetrain. Drivetrain yeah. wears out, but you're going to keep the bike. Yeah. You know, you're going to, you're not necessarily changing the bike out kind of thing, but you may just change and update components as you need to. And you may not, you know, you may just keep that bike, but you're going to keep that bike for that, for the amount of time, you know, for, you know, for maybe 15 years or 20 years or something. Yeah. And how many carbon bikes have you bought within that same window of time kind of thing? Yeah. So from an investment standpoint, you know, you know, as you said earlier, yeah, tie bikes a little bit more expensive up front, but if you keep it for longer, it actually works out to being cheaper in the long run. Yeah. Well, I mean, price of bikes nowadays, I don't know how much it, it's, is it really more expensive? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you, material costs did go up. Um, yeah. Shipping costs went up and this is all during the pandemic, right? Yeah. I mean, it was just the pandemic kind of exacerbated. But I mean, like in the scope of things is like, you can still get a tie bike for like four or five grand, right? You can get yeah. maybe a nicer carbon bike, like nicer in, in like air quotes with maybe better components or something like that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like the price point isn't like, it's not like, like we're talking about a, a, a five, all mountain bikes are five grand and the tie ones are 10. You, you know what I mean? Right. It, it, right. It's like, it's like a nominal amount, at least in my eyes, the way I look at it. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, compared to like a budget frame or something, like yeah, okay, you're not going to get a, a hardtail titanium frame for seven hundred yeah. bucks like you can from Santa Cruz. Okay, I get it there. You, you know what I mean? But um, I don't know. I I yes, there's a, a cost to it, but it's also like like what we've been talking about. I mean, it's it's a it's boutique boutique. It b it's 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 um it takes more craftsmanship to make and you know there's a lot of reasons that you pay for that and i feel like in yeah. my mind, i don't feel like you have to justify that you know at least to me you know i i think as as boutique as it sounds like i have for 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 our setup i have two guys that mm -hmm. do my cuttering cutting mitering welding finishing just two guys three guys mm -hmm. actually i take it back we have three guys um and that's it you know, you look at some of these other larger scale operations and they've got 40, 50 people kind of, but they're cranking out, they're cranking out bikes. Yeah. You know, you go over to, you know, so is there some, there's some, you know, some people will argue, well, there's no soul with those, those bigger, those bigger operations kind of thing, mm -hmm. because it's not that artisanal 
you yeah. know, two guys, three guys, one guy does this and one guy does that. And they're, that's it, you know, and there's a shop yeah. dog running around or whatever kind of thing. You can go over to going back to the, the concept of Asia, Asian production, you know, kind of touched on earlier kind of thing. You can go to Taiwan and a lot of those factories are family owned businesses kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's, but it's a production line that they've, it's like the same way how Ford made a production line and he just made it efficient to be able to crank out bikes. The, the quality of those welders over in Taiwan is still is, is amazing for what they do. Yeah. They just, there's a guy that all he does is stamp out chains, not stamp, but like yeah. bend chain stays. And then somebody else just welds that on. And that's all he does all day long kind of thing. But they crank out thousands of bikes kind of thing. But yeah. the quality of what they're doing is, is amazing. Is it, but it's all still handmade. Is it any yeah. less, is it truly any less artisanal than what I'm doing here? The difference is here, I can, I can customize the bike specifically to your, your, your design, your thoughts, your desires, mm -hmm. kind of you know, I can run bigger tubing, smaller tubing kind of thing, custom finish work, you know, and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. and, and I can really kind of get into, we can, if we need to move over something, you know, we had a customer, uh, who wanted to run a 50 tooth a uh, single ring for a gravel bike because he was going to run a classified drivetrain, which is a, a virtual, if you, um, it's a virtual uh, drivetrain kind of thing. And so we have a, we do 3D printed chainstay yokes. And so I had to sit with my engineer, my 3D engineer, and we had to figure out, all right, if the, the yoke wasn't designed for this, this size chain ring how much do we need to move it over so we figured out we needed to move it over by you know a couple of millimeters in kind of thing and but those are the personal touches that you get when you're getting something artisanal like this versus something where it's coming out of a factory but it's no yeah. less to your point just because the stuff coming out of the factory you know you can buy it for you know instead of a six thousand dollar frame you can buy it for you know three thousand dollars you know kind of thing is it any less quality no you know, yeah. and, you know, to your point kind of thing, budget stuff aside, but yeah, 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 it's kind of a, it's an interesting, interesting place to be, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, totally. But I think there's some, I don't know, I think there's something to be said about the smaller operations, like, oh, yeah, I'm fully supporting yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, obviously, right. But, um, so, you have you have basically a, a line of like like road bikes gravel bikes and and some mountain yeah. bike stuff is um is that like what you you want your portfolio to to like stay at or do you have plans to like do something different in the future or what are you thinking yeah for the most part yeah um i you know i've really tried to build the brand around being more performance oriented uh mm -hmm. kind of thing you know race bikes, bikes that go fast, bikes that are, you know, you can, you, you know, it's, I'm not making hybrids or cruisers kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's just yeah, yeah. not, it's not what I ride. So it's not yeah. really where I want it to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I am working on something that, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to show some, some samples of some stuff at Sea Otter for, you know, potentially, uh, working on a full suspension bike. Uh, so, oh, wow. Yeah, so that'll be kind of cool. It's we've been working on this for about a year and a half at this point. So schematics mm -hmm. are dialed and just kind of working on the the manufacturing process of it and that sort of thing. So yeah, that'll be interesting. Cool. Yeah, it's gonna be. I it's it looks good. I mean, we haven't we haven't actually built it yet, but in CAD, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> uh, so it's awesome there. Um, you know. I, I would like to do an e-bike in the future kind of thing. Just uh -huh. you know, if nothing else, it's my buddies and I, whenever we're riding and we get passed by an e-biker, we always, there, there's no grumbling or grovel, you know, or anything like that. It's more a case of, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, Yeah, uh, you know, we'll get it. But for right now, we all still enjoy pedaling, you know, yeah, hundred percent. So, yeah, but you know, I think for the most part, yeah, I think, you know, Sage is, is definitely a little bit more dirt focused. So it's mountain bikes and gravel bikes, and cyclocross bike, you know, I've got mm -hmm. the road bike in the lineup, but it's, uh -huh. uh, and it's a great road bike for sure. Um, but 
yeah, it's, uh, you know, it kind of, it rounds everything out. So yeah, yeah, I don't really see the line expanding too much more. I don't want to do like what Trek has done, for example, where they literally have SKUs for everything. And it's, yeah, like, yeah. that's a little too much, you know, yeah. but I can, I can so do what other people want. So if somebody wants something that I'm not making, we can make it. That's not a problem. Yeah. So, so how many bikes, like what, what is a company your size? How many bikes do you guys sell in a year? Or is that, you know, it's kind of proprietary, but yeah, okay. You know, I mean, we're we're doing all right. You know, it's, yeah. it's as I like to tell people, it's it's less than a thousand, but it's it's more than ten. Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. <laughs> Just trying to get an idea, you know what I mean? For yeah. for like generally speaking, not trying to like reverse engineer your your bank account or anything. No. <laughs> yeah, there's not much to reverse engineer. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um. You yeah, make, so you got a ramen soup laying around, so. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that's enough to 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 keep you busy like all year, like yeah. grinding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty it's pretty constant, uh, which is great. You know, we've we've done a we've done a really good job of you know just advertising and marketing and and just trying to get the brand name out there going to mm -hmm. shows we got sea otter coming up in uh in two weeks two and a half weeks and that's just been a, a pile of stress uh at the moment getting ready for that but we'll have some really cool stuff at the show and so i'm excited yeah. for that and uh northwest tune-up is a mountain bike show in bellingham uh in july in july and then we'll have the maid show in portland in august so yeah you know doing that stuff and then sending bikes out for reviews talking with people like yourself you know yeah. that sort of thing just trying to get the word out there that hey look at us yeah yeah everybody i was, I was <laughs> it's all right <laughs> if you don't say it out loud they'll never know <laughs> yeah, that's, <true. laughs> that's funny so like um what's what's stressful about going to sea otter like in my mind i'm i'm i i can i can relate but i i i don't know if everybody else that listens has has like the the reasoning like so it's this will be my eighth year uh going to sea otter so mm -hmm. you would think in the eight years that i've done this that it would be you know like clockwork it's it's right great. it kind of is i mean i i'm i'm really good about checklists and being organized so i've got this great checklist that i use every year and i just have to modify it slightly but it's it's still the stress of you know hotels lined up um have you talked with media have you invited in media to the booth have you you know figured out what vendors you're going to be talking with while you're there mm -hmm. uh you know, are the people that are going to be working in your booth, are they up to speed with everything that they need to be up to speed with? Mm -hmm. uh, T-shirts, stickers, hats, bike builds. I mean, we still have, this is, we're cutting it down to the wire. We've still got three bikes to build uh, for the show this coming week kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, it's just stress of just getting that all done. And it's just kind of, it's sea otter has turned into the industry show for the year um yeah you know when interbike used to be around it was easy for people to go to sea otter and you could do product launches and that sort of thing and but it was mainly to you know to talk with consumers yeah and that's and that's great i've always been a firm believer of consumer shows and especially because as a brand we do direct to consumer we also have dealers that we work with kind of thing and and mm -hmm. we have nice little blended model. Uh, and we have a couple of dealers that have been really good to us, but we do direct to consumer. So um, a industry only show can be somewhat limiting. So Sea yeah. Otter is a great place to, to meet consumers. And but it, when Interbike went away, there was all of a sudden a lack of a show here in the US where the industry got together in one yeah. spot, and you could actually have those types of meetings. And so Sea Otter in the last couple of years, definitely with the pandemic, but, um, you know, post pandemic has really turned into, it's a lot of meetings, like it's a yeah. lot, it's a lot of industry stuff. So you're, everybody's trying to get time with you, um, yeah. show you new products, um, you know, what kind of partnerships or collaborations are you going to do during the year, mm -hmm. um, 
advertisers are walking around trying to get you to to you know buy into their magazines and then of course you know there's 80,000 consumers that yeah. are here at the show and you you have to be you know you should be on your game you should be yeah. you know, full of energy and ready to greet everybody that walks into the booth and talk to everybody you know that's in the booth yeah. about you know, hey, come on in and check out our bikes and, and what makes us special and, you know, just come in and take a look. And, you know, if nothing else, you know, my goal is to make everyone that comes to the booth a fan. I'm not expecting yeah. everyone to buy. I'm not, it's not that hard sell kind of thing, but yeah. if you walk out with a t-shirt or, you know, you grab a sticker or something like that kind of thing. And you're like, that brand's pretty cool. Then that's a win in my book kind of thing, because it just, it kind of slow, it builds from there. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, that I think is super important to do. So there's just a lot that goes into it uh, kind of thing. Yeah. So much. I went to the last inner bike um, before they closed it down and the one oh, in, Reno. in Reno. Yeah. yeah. And um, that was kind of my first, like, like peek into what like the industry was like. And, yeah. uh, it was definitely a very different vibe. And I, from my understanding is that was also very different than the way it used to be like back in the day yeah. or something like that. But yeah. it was definitely like really weird to like walk into like a section where it's like, here's 40 booths that are all selling like e-bike batteries, you know? And it was yeah. like, this is crazy. This is not like, this is, I, I didn't think about it being like this, you know, or like, yeah. um, you know, frame builders or whatever and uh it, it was definitely very interesting i'm glad i got the opportunity to see it before it went away but i think that um at least from my perspective I, I, and it's probably different for you but i think that it's really i like the sea otter kind of of uh way of going about it where it's like a little mix of both i i agree no i i totally agree with you i i enjoy that as well i think the inner bike thing was good before the internet or in the early years of the internet kind of thing where it, yeah. it now with so many brands going consumer direct it's if you don't have consumers at the show you're you're missing your target audience so yeah. it's you know uh, i i love i love dealers um but dealers are at some level you know are either you know tied to one of the main four brands and mm -hmm. so their hands get tied to some extent kind of thing. Um, or they're just, you know, they, they have their own special niche for where they are. And sometimes they're necessary. There isn't necessarily room for everybody in their store and they may want to bring you in, but there just isn't the ability. So then yeah. what am I to do? I need to go direct to the consumer. So, you know, I would rather, I would rather have, if someone's listening to this podcast right now and goes, I should call Dave, I will pick up the phone and talk with you kind of thing. And like, yeah. and that's, that's the experience I want people to have kind of thing. And so I want them to feel like, Oh, wow, this was really a personalized experience. And you just can't get mm -hmm. that at some of those other shows and that sort of thing. And I think you're absolutely right. Sea Otter is that, that nice blended mix of, yeah, yeah it's a, it's a much more personalized experience. Yeah. Like me, I go usually Thursday and Friday just because I want to talk to you guys, you know, like the, the, the companies and, and actually have, you know, some, some kind of conversations because yeah. the weekends are like, Oh my God, it's like, it's insane how many people show up and you're like, even when the weather's shitty, you're like, wow, there's still like, like an ass ton of people here. And, um, yeah. I, I can imagine that after, what is it like four days of you guys being in those tents, just like marketing all day long, you know, just like with your, your, your people hat on, you're, you're definitely probably tapped out for a good week after you get back. Well, the, the thing that keeps us going is it's really important to have a steady stream of cookies and chips. And then <laughs> we have a, we have a cooler in the back with waters and, and Coca-Cola, Mexican Coke, mm -hmm. not the, not the other stuff. And then uh, when the day is over, it's it's all about beer. So yeah. as long as we kind of refuel and rehydrate, you're good. And there's nothing good like stuff. everybody high on sugar. So right, right. Uh, as long as you can do that, like, great, no problem. You're eating a salad. Good. That's fine. Eat four cookies because you need that sugar. <laughs> boost. That salad's not giving you the sugar boost there. Come on. <laughs> so. Exactly. So um, what makes what makes Sage stand out 
compared to like other brands that people could choose from? Um, I like to think it's the, the, the personalized experience, as I mentioned earlier, kind of thing. Um, you know, you get to, you get to talk with me and, and I, I know how I want to be treated and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. I, I know if I were calling up a brand, you know, this is what I would hope and want for them to, you know, make me feel like a, not necessarily a king, like I'm not, exp I'm not trying to be demanding or anything along those lines, but it's, you know, I'm building my dream bike with you. And so right. I want, you know, I want someone who understands that concept and every bike that I've built for a customer is a dream bike. And so I get that. And I, and I love living that every day of building people's dream bikes. It's like, it's it just because it's not mine at the end of the day and it's going out the door and it's going to be yours doesn't mean that I don't get the same joy and pleasure out of putting it together and I'm having this amazing creation. Yeah. So, you know, I want that. I want people to recognize that. Um, I want, um, I, I want to be, you know, Sage is kind of cutting edge as far as using, utilizing 3D printing. Uh, we were one of the first brands to really start using Cerakote, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, for, we've been using it for quite a number of years just because of the durability of it and what it can do. So, you know, finishes and just the artwork that we do and, um, you know, trying to make every bike unique and, and personalized and it's, you mm -hmm. know, trying to, trying to do that. And then ultimately it's about the, the performance of the bikes. You know, we, mm -hmm. we're, we're very big on sending bikes out for reviews and, uh, you know, getting people to don't take just our word for it, you know, go, you know, come to your channel and, and see a review of our bike, go to any other channel or read the reviews on our website kind of thing. It's not just us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We believe in the bikes, but here's what other people are saying too. Like we're not all yeah. crazy kind of thing. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, um, what material are you guys 3d printing? Titanium. Oh, okay. Do you do yeah. that in house or you design it in house and then have somebody else do it or uh design it in-house uh wow. so using the the cad software and then we're having the stuff printed here in the u.s uh, uh -huh. so it's, it's uh that's interesting yeah those machines that print metal like that are, are super expensive i was oh I saw they're, yeah they're crazy they're like they're easily a couple hundred thousand dollars for sure yeah yeah get easily up into a million so it's uh for the 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 companies that are doing it here domestically it just makes sense for them to it makes sense to just use them as a contract uh, mm -hmm. uh manufacturing because then i don't have to own the expense of the machine because the thing is when you own the machine at some point that machine is going to become outdated and yeah. new technology is going to come along that is going to make the prints better whatever is going to be better about it kind of thing so now what do you do with that old machine do you can can you get rid of it if you you know is it on a lease yeah. is it a contract you know did you buy it outright so it's just a less of a headache from a, a capitalization yeah. standpoint. And so. Yeah, I don't know how long that stuff lasts, you know, like like you can buy machines for actual machining. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I work for a company that has a machine shop. We build things out of titanium and all kinds of stuff. Right. And uh like some of those machines that we have are like, I don't know, freaking from the 80s or something like that. You know what I mean? They're yeah. still like cutting metal. That's what they do. But as far as like a, a 3D printer, I mean, I I don't know. You know what I mean? That's yeah. that's like a different thing. You know, it's a whole different piece. So I think one of the first lathes, metal lathes I ever saw was at a, a local local engineer guy here in Portland kind of thing. I needed something fixed and he was like, oh yeah, bring it over. He's like, I'll, I'll throw it on the lathe and you know, I can, I can make, it was like a seat post topper or something like that. And basically he just took another block of aluminum at the, you know, this is years ago kind of thing. And yeah. he just spun it up in the lathe and, and, and it just, and it just cut it out. And it was, it was just, it was amazing to watch. And he goes, yeah, this lathe is actually, this is U S army surplus. And it was from world war II. Yeah. And he goes, but the precision of it, it was so good. He's like, I'll never get rid of this. And it's just, yeah, yeah I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. but the lasers and everything else and, you know, it's like, it's, you know, it's like the computers that we're using right now, you know, it's, you know, how fast did these become outdated before something with more memory, more CPU yeah. RAM, and all that better resolution comes along. And it's just, you know, at some point, you know, 
you have you have a box of cables that do nothing yeah exactly yeah yeah it's crazy um last year at sea otter you, you had seth there in your tent so i'm sure that yeah. probably brought a bunch of traffic over there that was great yeah seth is awesome um he is he he is exactly like you see on on his channel he is really yeah. that legitimate nice person kind of thing um yeah it worked out great it was it was it was cool how we got to him and how he got to us and it just kind of we had a mutual contact um you know through a, a pr agency we were both working with and uh he had just he had wanted to end his sponsorship with uh with diamondback mm -hmm. uh, and he wanted to be able to uh ride and and review other stuff that he didn't have to worry about being beholden to anybody yeah, so yeah. when when we built that bike for him he was adamant about paying for it there was mm -hmm. no there was no gifting of it because i i've had a lot of people go oh you know you gave him the bike right you know you did all that for free and that sort of thing i was like no 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 he paid for it know and and that way then when he when he speaks of the bike that is his honest review so it, it came out great so when we got the opportunity for sea otter and he was like yeah he's like i'm coming i'm like can i get the bike in the booth he's like yeah just people went crazy for it yeah yeah, yeah. how was that experience of like having your product on on that kind of like stage so to speak it was I mean, great. he's got a lot of influence. I mean, he could talk about somebody's like, you know, t-shirt company and all of a sudden they're like, yeah, and our website's down, you know, <laughs> like. It was good. Uh, I, I will admit I got some orders uh, directly from him kind of thing. Not yeah. directly from him, but because yeah. of him kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was great. And it was just, it was just good exposure. I think the, the coolest thing was when we had the bike in the booth, and he he posted it up on social. Hey, I'm going to be at Sea Otter. You know, if you want to see my bike, it's going to be in the Sage booth. He didn't hang out in our booth so much. He he used our booth as kind of a home base to like drop yeah, yeah. stuff and then and then go out. Um, because if he if he stayed in one place too long, he would get swarmed and swamped, and he'd never make appointments. So he was constantly on the move, but his yeah. bike was there, and so people would come to the booth and ask. The funniest question was, is that is this a replica? Is this really Sage's uh, Seth's bike? And they go, yes, yeah. it's really Seth's bike. And they go, are you sure? And I'm like, I I'm pretty sure it's really Seth's bike. He gave it to us, so I'm pretty sure it's, you know. <laughs> and they would go, okay. And then they'd ask if they could take a picture with yeah. the bike. And so people were doing that, you know, they were getting all selfie with it kind of thing. It was just, it was yeah. really kind of funny to watch. And it was sweet at the same time. And even at other shows later in the year that I did, we were at Northwest Tune Up as like a, as I mentioned earlier, a mountain bike show up in Bellingham. People were coming up and going, "You built Seth's bike, right?" I'm like, yeah. And they're like, "Oh my God, what you know? What's that like?" And he talked about this and he talked about that, and more than happy to chat all about that. Yeah. Sort of stuff. And it's just, it was just people love learning about the bike and and learning about why he liked it and you know and and why he did what he did kind of thing and you know it was just it was a really cool experience kind of thing and it just yeah, yeah. it raised awareness for sage and that's that's all i can ask for you know kind of yeah thing. other than the fact that honestly he loves the bike my my biggest fear was that he would call me up on the first day and go you screwed up you know, yeah something like that i don't think he would have done that but he called me up and the, the story is, is that he called me up and he goes, um, Dave, um, we need to talk. And it felt like I was being called to the principal's office. <laughs> oh, God. And I just kind of hung my head low and was like, oh, this isn't going to go well. And right, he goes, here we go. Yeah. He starts it out with, he goes, you've ruined me. And I was like, oh, God. And he goes, for non-custom bikes. And then he just starts going off about how he loves the bike. And it was like... Yeah my heart skipped a couple of beats like I, i'm pretty sure i had a heart attack if i was actually you know feeling yeah anything. but it, my heart got back into rhythm and i was okay and but yeah he, he loved the bike i'm sure for him too because he, he's pretty short so yeah i would imagine that there's a lot of like like oh to make this bike what we do is we design it for tall people or normal sized people and then we just shrink it and so there's probably a lot of things that throughout his time riding bikes that like 
it's not till just recently that companies started like, oh, we're going to make different size chain stays and different this and different that to, for the different sizing. So I would imagine for him to have a, something that's custom like that, it's it's probably a huge like game changer in the way that that everything feels, you know? Yeah, I think generally speaking, when, whenever I'm talking with a customer, it's really about the fit of the bike more mm -hmm. than more than the geometry, you know, mm -hmm. of, you know, how does the, if you have an existing bike, you know, you mentioned your black heart kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If that black heart fits you, I'm not talking about the geometry, but yeah. you feel comfortable on the bike. Your, your neck doesn't hurt. Your shoulders don't hurt after really long rides. Your back doesn't hurt. Your knees yeah. don't hurt, whatever. Like you just feel like you feel great. Now the bike may handle no bike has felt that way to me since I was like 20, but I think it's just because I'm old. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 yeah I, I'm yeah. joking. I'm joking. I'm totally joking. <laughs> you know, we as as we get older, for sure, we are definitely less flexible. The stems yeah. are going more upright, kind of thing. Yeah. You know, at some point, we're all just riding like those, you know, those penny th farthings from back in the nineteen right. twenties. Um, and uh, but I, you know, it, it's really about the the fit of the bike yeah. and your contact points where your handlebars yeah. are where your seat is and where your pedals are all in relation to the bottom bracket and just yeah. how your body fits on the bike and if you're comfortable on your existing bike whether or not you've had a fit you know i can then either replicate the fit of the bike but then put it on my geometry. So the bike is going to handle like a sage, but it's going to feel like your black heart in, in yeah, this. Yeah. 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 And when you get on it, you're going to have that, you're going to have that immediate feeling of like, Oh, my body feels exactly like it should. Like I feel great on this bike. Cause I felt great on the black heart, but yeah. the bike rides different because the angles are a little different and it's snappier here or it's quicker handling there. And all of a sudden yeah. you see the difference between the bikes. Yeah. And so, you know, with Seth and especially, you know, other people, I, the smallest rider I ever built a bike for, she was four foot 11 or five foot. Like it was really small and toe yeah. overlap was an issue. And, but, you know, we, we made some changes and, and she loves the bike, but it was, it was shrinking it down and not all riders just because you're five feet tall or you're six foot six. And I, I built a bike for a guy that's six, eight. So I've done everything in between mm -hmm. the bikes are different and the, where you're based, you shouldn't have the same lane chain stays between those two bikes using that as the example you brought yeah, up. Yeah. Like it should be different because your, your center, your, your, where you're centered on the bike is different for each individual person, you have to take into account wheel size and all that sort of stuff. And it's just, it's not, you can't just, you know, cookie cutter the whole thing and, yeah. and, stuff and expect it to work. I mean, but at some point that's what production bikes are. They're cookie cutter, you know, yeah. like, you know, you, you try and come up with a good geometry, but it's not going to work for everybody. And that's why people, some people need custom. Yeah. Do you guys do more custom than like just people come and order or is it kind of a, yeah, we, so we actually did for quite a number of years, we did mainly production runs. Mm -hmm. And so it would be stock sizing, you know, 52, 54, 56, small, medium, large, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and we were doing those uh, for quite a while. And then slowly but surely, the custom side of the business just kind of started picking up on its own. Um, mm -hmm. More people were asking for the bikes and they kind of wanted to tweak a little of this or they wanted a little of that. And it was just all of a sudden it was like, well, all right, we're doing more custom. And mm -hmm. when the pandemic hit, we blew out of all of our inventory, like just everything was gone. Um, mm -hmm. And so ever since the pandemic ended, we've just been building custom at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the the desire has been. I think there's there's a possibility we'll get back to production runs later because it does bet there is a benefit to that it's just it's yeah there there's the simplicity to it kind of thing it is what it is and and the majority of people out there can get away with production bikes yeah but if you're going custom you know there's no reason to have four centimeters of headset spacers below your stem if you can yeah it's like well all right then maybe you should get a custom in that regard so yeah 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 i mean i'm sure there's a a, a number that you can figure out like hey i can order this many like cut like 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 production runs 
and those will those will trickle through whatever amount of time and then other than that then because i'm sure there's some people that they just they just want to come and like hit buy and be done with it you know what i mean like, yeah. yeah 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 and and that's and that's that's one of the things that we're that right now that we're missing kind of thing yeah. is that ability to go this is in stock in these sizes if you hit buy we'll ship this out to you in a week yeah you know, we'll put like together all and yeah, together. it's all done. We've got all the parts, everything's here, that sort of stuff. So, but how right. does the custom process work work for somebody? Like they call you up and they're like, You guys are like, Hey, do you want to pick every part or do you we have these sort of packages or how, how does it work out? Yeah, it's 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 both actually. Uh usually what it is is people will check out the website, um, uh, and we have a bike builder on there, which is more of a guide than anything else. It gives you a whole bunch of options. It gives you our preferred brands that we use, but we can basically get anything. So mm -hmm. if we don't have something listed on the website, we can certainly get it. That's not a problem. And yeah. what the the person will end up doing is they'll usually do some research on the bike, kind of start looking at like, well, I'm interested in this, I'm interested in that. And then they'll usually make a phone call or an email of, um, you know, hey, how do I... Um, uh do this how do i get uh i'm interested in this build or i'm interested in this setup you know what's the process kind of thing and so mm -hmm. inevitably it's it's me that usually it's answering the phone kind of thing um and i get copied on all the the emails that come through the general folder so i'm usually responding so i'm your kind of your customer service guy in that regard and we'll we'll basically go through i'll answer your questions about you know why this design over this design what are you intending to do and that sort of stuff do you have a budget that you want to hit kind of thing you know mm -hmm. what's important to you kind of thing some people have no budget some people do doesn't yeah. matter you know more than half yeah, yeah. everybody and um once you kind of feel comfortable with where it's going to go and and all right well here's going to be the number um you can there are some people that will buy directly through the website and they'll pick out everything they want i want a 56 gravel bike and i want it with these parts and these wheels and comes out to this price and they just hit buy and that's it it's done yeah. like okay great after that i will call you and go okay here's the deal you know this is where we're at and this is what it's going to be and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. um but then for those others that have um that have uh called in um, you have the option if you want that you can also just put down a 50% deposit uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the balance is due prior to shipping. So if we have any sort of changes that we're making during the process, then the final invoice is, you know, reflected accurately. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. For the person who paid full up front, it's the same thing. They just don't have to make a payment at the end. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah. Kind of, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of emails that go back and forth. Uh, if it's a custom frame, um, what you'll do is you'll either give me, um, you'll either go get a fitting done, uh, at, if you're here in Portland, I have a fitter that works with me that I, you know, I send all of my clients to. So if you're here, I'll send you to him. And mm -hmm. if you're not here, you would go to your local fitter and mm -hmm. I'll get those fit numbers from that person. And I'll design the bike. And then when I design the frame, um, I will then send you an email with a very long list of notes of here's everything you need to know about this kind of thing. And if there's stuff you don't understand or it's too much or whatever, I'm more than happy to shorten it or explain everything and all that. And basically, we go through the process of this matches, this matches, this doesn't match, and this is why it doesn't match. Or we need to change this or change that or, you know, you know. Maybe you just mm -hmm. don't like the way it looks for whatever reason. You weren't happy with your fit and, you know, well, this is the bike that based on your fit, this is what it looks like and this is what we have to do. So, you know, we we talk it through and we go through it. Ultimately, in the end, you have final approval over what mm -hmm. the design is going to be. So I don't build anything until I actually get an email from you saying mm -hmm. you have approved the final design. Uh, once that's done then it goes to my welders and they they build the bike and then we build it up and and there you so go like how how custom is custom is it like i want my chain stays to be this long and i have this much reach and i want my like yeah my my brake mount to be like a, a 203 native or something like like what all like that what, that is that is where it goes 
Yeah. All that, of those pieces. All of that and the above. And uh, I actually think there was someone uh, there was someone I saw on the Instagram post you you put up earlier was asking about uh, single speed. Uh, and the mm -hmm. answer is yes, we can make any we can do all of our bikes as single speed. Like that's not a problem. So uh, yeah, we, yeah. We use slider drops there. So yeah, we can do all of that above. So if you want this length, chain stays great. If you want this reach, great. Um, I'm more than happy to do those things, but let's make sure it actually works. Just because you're picking that arbitrary number. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I know I want my reach to be, you know, 540. Forty, which is insane yeah. kind of thing. And it's like, okay, wait, let's talk this through kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. Why are you saying that now? Yeah. What, what, where did you get that number from kind of thing? And it's like, okay, yeah. but if that's, if you've got reasoning for it and you're like, that's what I want. Okay. As long as you're signing off on it, I'll build it, you know, yeah. but I'm going to give you my thoughts and opinions on, well, maybe we should bring it back a little bit shorter. Cause I think you're going to, yeah. you're going to appreciate that kind of thing. And, you know, uh, yeah. Do you know the guy that does that's doing ministry ministry bikes? Yeah, yeah. I think he's in your area too. Uh, For some I reason, Idaho. Oh, I thought he was in that in that Oregon area because maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not. Yeah, I, maybe I'm remembering. I thought it was wrong. Idaho. I, it's he, close. He's he's in the general vicinity. Yeah, yeah. He's doing these like uh, dropouts that like bolt onto the frame. What do you think about that? They're pretty cool. I like what he yeah. does. I mean, he's, yeah. you know, everything when he was doing speed goat stuff and, and that sort of thing, he always has been unique and funky with the designs and engineering. He's super smart. Like, yeah, like he's it's his stuff is well thought out kind of thing. And, you know, some of it may be a little too much at different times kind of thing. But yeah. other times it's cool. Like that that squishy bike that he's working on that he's, you know, he's got up and going kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I forgot what it's called, but it's like a 150 travel bike. Yeah, um, I think Psalm or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's ministry it, cycles. So yeah. Um that thing, that that that's a good looking. I would like to swing a leg over that kind of thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was really cool. bummed out whenever the uh the the original frame wasn't working out and it sounded like he was just gonna start, you know, doing the front triangles by whoever would do them or whatever. And it seems like that that got some some revitalization by some college or something like that that's working up on it for him because yeah. that bike just looks i don't know if you did you see it last year at sea otter i didn't see it at sea otter but i've been watching the videos his yeah uh, reels on uh ig yeah 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 he definitely goes down the rabbit hole i can see what you're saying there. there's some times where you're like dude i don't think it matters that much but you know <laughs> no but i mean oh, yeah. it's, but you know he's thought it through like if yeah, anybody has thought it through it's like yeah, he's got it. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. He, he's got his rationale. <laughs> yeah. I really like those dropouts though. And to, in my mind, I was like, man, like so many bike companies, that should be a normal thing to, to, to be honest. Like if you could just yeah. change the dropouts on your bike and be like, oh, I want it to be a mullet or all oh, I want it to be, you know, like, like so easily change the, the bike from like maybe one wheel size to another with a different, like, because they're doing the, the headsets, the offset headsets now too, and yep. not necessarily him, but like right, right. where you could you could change your bike from like a 29er to a to a 27.5 with different dropouts on that and be pretty damn close. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not too far off kind of thing. No, it, yeah. it's, it's amazing what can be done if you factor it into the design and that yeah. Um no, I, I think I think what he's doing is super cool kind of thing. Um definitely that is his that is his thing for sure yeah there his bike should be out somewhere around like 2057 or something like that i think when he, he'll be done figuring it out by then but uh no i'm i'm really stoked to see how that goes it, it, yeah. it's definitely um so you said the maid show in portland is that the the hand-built bike yep. show or whatever yeah last year was the first one and so yeah we're coming up this will be year two kind of thing it was fantastic like yeah like that was just, it was awesome. There were so many builders there. I mean, it was, I think it was over a hundred. Um, mm -hmm. And when the show ended, they had a waiting list of over a hundred brands and builders trying to get in for next year kind of thing. Yeah. So everybody who was there for year one had right of refusal to come back and got first first dibs on boot space kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah. Else got filtered in, but because it was just, 
they, they've been very, very fair about how they've been doing it. Um, yeah, the, the fact it's in, it's at a, um, a, an old shipyard called uh, the Zydell, Z-I-D-E-L-L Yards, Zydell mm -hmm. Yards. And it's like this, if you see pictures of it, the place is like this rusted hulk of a warehouse where clear, there's cranes up above where they clearly were, you know, shipping containers would come in and they get dropped yeah. off. And I don't know if it's still functioning. I don't think it is, or maybe it is, and we just get to rent it out, but they do like a motorcycle show there, but it's just, it's super, like, it's just a cool burned out kind of facility. Like it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it looks so cool. And um, mm. it was, it was just, it was awesome last year. Like it was just the crowds that came in. Um, it was, we were slammed. Like it was, I'll never forget. It opened like Friday at noon is when it actually opened. And it was, you could literally see if, you know, for where we were, we were kind of, our booth was kind of in the middle of the, the, the room, if you will, mm -hmm. you can see, we, if you look down the aisle, you can kind of see the, the, the entrance. It was literally like a tidal wave of people coming in and it yeah. just it flooded in. And it was like from 12 to six on Friday. Cause it was only like a half day on Friday, or maybe it was Thursday, whichever it was. It was just this, it was nonstop. Like I have never been, I mean, that was, I was exhausted those days. Yeah. It was like, yeah, you were just, you know, there was not enough, you know, cookies and, and Coca-Cola, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, that was bringing the big guns. Like it was like bringing a cake and some ice cream kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> right on, man. Mainline that stuff. Just give it to me straight in my arm, doc. <laughs> right. Just, just right here it is. <laughs> yeah. They, they had, you used to have that, that's that hand built show in Sacramento. And unfortunately I didn't ever go to it whenever it was here. And now I think, that one, I think that one travels around. The, so NABS, North American Handmade Bike. Yeah, something like yes. that. Yeah. That one, yeah, you're absolutely right. That one traveled around and it would go to different spots all around the country every year. And so there was kind of a big deal that it would like, hey, next year we're going to be in Charleston, you know, and yeah. then this year we're going to be in Minneapolis and next year we're going to be in Austin and then Portland. And, and that was kind of cool. But um, from a logistical standpoint, it, it became a bit of a nightmare for, for builders and brands because now you're shipping stuff all over the country yeah. Um, and you don't know, you know, is the market, you know, going to be, um, Worth it. yeah, kind of thing. Like I heard some years that, you know, attendance, depending on the place, the attendance was pretty bad kind of thing. Yeah. It just, there wasn't, you know, yeah, there may be, there may be a good cycling culture there, but there wasn't enough to really yeah. sustain the show. So some people would question like, well, West Coast builders would go, well, do I really want to go to the East Coast? And East Coast builders would say the same thing. Yeah. With the the Portland show, with the Maid show, the it's specifically only going to be in Portland. Like it's not moving anywhere else. Yeah. We've got, we've got an international airport. We've got great hotels. We've got a great cycling community kind of thing. And it's just... Yeah. People were flying in from all over and it's, it's easy to book rooms. You don't have to worry that you're in some, you know, smaller town or it's, you know, travel is going to be weird or you're going to some regional yeah. airport or something like that. And it's not like a normal, like convention kind of city too. So I'm pretty sure yeah. you don't have to be like worried about button up against, you know, like the international ba basket weavers assembly or something like that, that week. So Portland, I think we do actually have a basket weavers conference. Uh, <laughs> that, that's right along with the, the ball of yarn uh, festival as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a that's a good one. It's it's pretty popular with the cat lovers. Um, yeah, yeah. You gotta watch out there, man. Eugene's got that. Uh, what is it? The Renaissance one or whatever. They're probably taking some of your your hotels too. Don't don't mess with the Renaissance people. <laughs> they, they take that seriously, and they have weapons. Uh, you yeah. know, ball of yarn festival. It's like a cat with claws and a and a ball of yarn. Like, uh, <laughs> is there as opposed to a guy with a sword? <laughs> Um, Funny story about the Renaissance thing in, in Eugene. I'm one of those people that like never plans for anything like, and, and, and also one of those people that it's got, like, I've gotten away with it my entire life. So there's zero reason for me to actually change. Sure. And, uh, one of my work trips, I was like, normally I just drive to Eugene and I'm like, do whatever I got to do. And then I like find a hotel or maybe like while I'm there or maybe yeah. like while I'm driving. Right. And uh, this one particular time I went up there with my wife and I'm like, yeah, she's like, did you get a, a, a hotel? I'm like, no, not yet. I'll figure it out when we get there. 
She's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. And lo and behold, it was like the Renaissance Fair weekend or whatever the hell that thing is that's going on in there. And apparently all like 15 hotels in Eugene were like completely booked. We went to like three of them until I finally got one that was like, oh yeah, we have the handicap room still. I'm like, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that was the that was the one time where I was like, maybe this thing isn't working out. You maybe I should start booking ahead of time. So, yeah, I think I think you could still wing it a little bit, kind of thing. But like I said, <laughs> the, the Renaissance Festival uh, that's a that's yeah. a tough one. So you know, yeah, Tilly like, didn't know that was happening. So. No, no, that one. Well, I mean, it's not on your calendar, right? <laughs> Jeez. I thought like Google would just inject it in there like they do with the other holidays and shit like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um, you have these models of bikes that you do the production runs on and right. you're doing all this custom stuff. How do you decide to make design changes on the, the, the production run stuff? Like what, what is, is there like a, a timeline or is it just like you need to see something intriguing? Like, Hey, I guess, SRAM decided we're all going to change our dropouts now or like, yeah, that, that definitely plays a part in it kind of thing. Something like that's a little bit more of an immediate, like that affects everything kind yeah. of thing. Like every single model that we'd be making in a production run. Yeah. That's like, okay, we need to switch everything to T type dropouts. Like, uh, okay, well that's, that's a thing now. Um, yeah. You know, but it's in the grand scheme of things, it's like, but once you do it, it's like, okay. So then, there is the fear of, well, all right, I have all these other frames that are non T type that are still in inventory and we're switching over to T type. So it, now it's going to be clearance sale. Let's get rid of the non T type stuff. And, you know, you're trying to get the old inventory out. So you're not sitting on it because nobody's going to want it because they want the new stuff. So you got to do that. Beyond that, yeah. I'd say it's probably, it, it's trying to keep a life cycle of every, you know, three, four years kind of thing of, uh -huh of maybe there's an update and you know and and if you're doing an update there's it's it's not i'm never trying to do an update to necessarily lighten up the bike for example it's mm -hmm. it's the dropouts it's maybe we're um you know gravel bikes that we've been using yokes for example uh for a while before we started doing our 3d printed ones we were making solid titanium ones so they were just a solid metal bar it Can you explain what that is to somebody that doesn't know what it is? The, the yoke. yoke. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if you uh, basically, if you look behind your chain rings, um, a yoke. If you a yoke is uh, a, uh, a a a piece of metal, if you will, a piece in our case titanium that is shaped in such a way that it allows us to run a um a certain up to a certain size chain ring and have clearance for a certain size tire at the same time where if you did so not basically it's the metal piece that comes off of the bottom bracket that the chain stays connect to yes there and it go. sits directly behind the chain rings like the right. chain rings are like in front of it so you don't really see it kind of thing yeah but the reality is if you didn't have a yoke there and you had the the chain stay being the full length tube from the bottom bracket to the dropouts you would have to manipulate the chain stay so much that you would potentially weaken it so you're yeah. either you're dimpling it too much you're shaping it too much and it's just structurally it's going to fail so mm -hmm. instead of putting a, a full tube there you basically put just a basically a flat piece of metal or because at the end of the day like for people to visualize like when you're building these they're coming in in tubes like round tubes it's not like you you reach out to somebody and you're like hey make me a mold and we pour this hot titanium in there like wax and it comes out shaped however no. we want no it, <laughs> all, all of our all of our tubes come in as round tubes and anything yeah. that is shaped bent pinched dimpled you know pressed that is something we do by hand kind of thing right. like we've got we've got machines that will you know, they make a dent in a certain spot kind of thing, or they'll, they'll bend a chain stay a certain, you know, a certain way. And then you bend it back the other way and that sort of yeah. stuff. It's all done by hand. So, but it's, it's a straight round tube when it comes in kind of thing. It is yeah. not, we don't, we're not ordering stuff that's, and even if we did order stuff that was 
shape to begin with. It started out as a round tube to begin with. It didn't start out as, so somebody else may have shaped it for us, but we do all of our shaping in house. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so the yoke, the yoke allows you to run, um, uh, in our case, you know, we can run like on our gravel bikes, we have two different size yokes. And so it kind of depends on what you're doing, but you can run like a 700 by 50 millimeter tire and a, uh, a 48 31 or a 48 35, uh, chain ring combo, which is pretty big with a 50 mil tire because you run into clearance issues of the tire. You have to move. You need so much clearance between the chain stay and the tire that you have to move the chain stay out to clear the tire. Well, that's going to hit the chain rings at that point. So that's where the right. yoke comes in that we can make without using the tube, we can actually clear the chain rings and clear the tire at the same time. So it kind of. So, so before to... people would print that, they were just machining that piece. Yeah. You you would machine it and weld it in. And it was just usually a solid chunk of titanium or steel right, or right. aluminum or, you know, whatever. So then it would get expensive too. Cause you're like, essentially paying for whatever you're not using, like what you're machining out, the a scrap and like. Correct. So, so the 3D printing process, I'm assuming is, is a little cheaper or, or it just it, gives you more flexibility in design. It, uh, it gives you more flexibility in design for sure. Um, I'd say cost wise, it's, it actually is a little bit cheaper if you print in scale. So mm -hmm. if you print, if I print, you know, um, if I print 15 yokes at once, that is going to be cheaper per piece than if I were to machine out um, 15 yokes because yeah. the machining process for machining 15 yokes, there's it, that takes so much time because you only are doing you're only doing one yoke at a time on that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the print, it just all prints at the same time. Like it's 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 like Star Trek and the replicators kind of thing. It's like. Yeah you know make me a cup of tea and whoop, it pops out and there you go and you know make, make me a sage yolk there you yeah. go <laughs> yeah, well, that's pretty much it um and that's yeah. that's how it goes and the file is done so we don't have to you just literally just hit print on the machine and whoop, it pops out so like i've so got you guys like you guys build the the file and then like just spit out the g code for them or they have to like manipulate your cad stuff and and turn it into like printing stuff um no i mean we've we've got cad here uh mm -hmm. and i have uh here in the shop i have my own uh resin printers mm -hmm. so i'll print samples and um and of everything that we do and i will then and that's the beauty of it from a, a prototyping standpoint is that i can print out samples give them to my welders and then they can check the measurements and yeah. see, okay this fits this doesn't fit okay you need to, we need 0.3 millimeters here we need you know four eighths over here or whatever it is kind of thing um and you can you can make those adjustments on the fly and printing out a a yoke in resin the the amount of for the amount of resin that it takes to print out it, it comes out to like a dollar fifty kind of thing yeah. for a sample and it's a it yeah it's plastic but it's full size and you can yeah we can run a DI2 wire through. We can see if the wire fits kind of thing or a shift line kind of thing. We can see, we can mount it up on the chainstay in the bottom bracket, you know, and yeah. just kind of glue it together, if you will, for purposes of does the tire clear? Does this clear? And then obviously you can see it all in CAD too, but yeah. it's to be able to, to mock it up. And so yeah, I have a friend that was painting for one of the major brands that they would 3D print their frames and then send it to him. And then he would like paint them so that they look like their production ones, like put them together. Yeah. And then they, they would like build them and then they would, you know, stand in the showroom and be, or whatever, you know, at the office and be like, oh, huh, okay, that looks good. That doesn't look good or whatever. Yeah. And uh, they actually got to the point where they had to put signs on them because they just look like a real bike. And then people would go sit on it. It's like a plastic bike that's like glued together. <laughs> and, just, like, and now it's broken. <laughs> yeah. Wait, that broke a little too easily. Well, yeah. yeah wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, no. No, luckily we have, well, with titanium, we don't have that issue. But um, yeah. but it's just, it allows me to rapid prototype. You know, yeah. I can literally make changes. Uh, hang on, let me just go into my CAD file really quick. Okay, there's an extra two millimeters. And then hit, boop, yeah. hit print again. And it takes an hour for it to spit out of the printer rather yeah. than we have to, you know, if, 
if we're not machining it, if we have another machine shop that's doing it, yeah. then they have to like, well, we've got five other things to do today. Yeah, we'll yeah, get to yeah. it tomorrow. Like now ah, we just rapid, you know, just rapid. For prototyping, prototyping 3D printing is just so rad. How oh. do you like that resin printer? I have like a, like something that does just like PLA and Petchy and stuff like that. But I don't have a I, resin one. The, the resin one is great. Um, I actually just got, I'm on my second one now. I got, uh, there's a brand called Anycubic and they okay. have, um, they had a, a five, I think it was a 5K uh, resolution, something like that, like really super high resolution kind of thing. And it, but it's a high speed printer. So I can print out, I forgot what the volume is, but I can print out like a massive piece kind of thing in an mm -hmm. hour. But the, yeah. the resin is a different resin. The only problem with it is um, the um, it's it's pretty toxic as far as the the fumes that are coming out. So the ventilation yeah. system that you need is is no joke. It's not like go go do some go look up some YouTube videos on VOCs and resin yeah. printers, and it's like you need to be wearing a mask. You need to be wearing a <laughs> mask when you're doing this don't like you need to have windows open you need to have ventilation going on like it's yeah. not this isn't something you can do in your like your home office unless right you know, right you're gonna get cancer and you're all good with that kind of yeah. thing but um i'm pretty but sure we have those resin ones that work i've just i've never never used them so they're cool i i think for the stuff that we do i think the pla would actually be fine um the yeah. you, it's the the resin gives you better detail but for the stuff that i'm printing pla works fine yeah. as well so it's you know but there's a part of me i i like to screw around and make models and yeah it. so the resin gives you a little bit yeah. more detail. 3d printing has changed my life man and honestly like i originally didn't buy one for a long time because i thought i knew the rabbit hole that i was going to go down if i got one. Oh yeah and and I severely underestimated the size of the rabbit hole. <laughs> it's it's just like so many things that, like for instance, the other day my wife walked in and she's like, do me a favor. I'm like, what? She's like, I broke the cap on my mascara. Can you print me another one? And it's like, yep. Yeah. You know, just like, like, yeah, I can do that. You know, <laughs> like just some of it's little shit like that. That's completely stupid. And other stuff is like, man, I need to like, uh, they, I have EXT fork. They don't have a, um, there's no aftermarket company that makes like a bolt on, on fender mount. So it's like, but there's screw holes back there. I'm like, all right, I'm going to design one, you know? So that's awesome. and it's like, yeah, I can have that now. It's, you know, it's it, yeah. that, that part of it. And I think it just tickles me too, because I just like creating shit. So yeah. it's like, like you can just dream up anything. You're like, and I want to see what a horse with a pig head looks like, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to print these out, yep. you know, whatever. So and my buddies are going to want them too. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going to sell these on Etsy and nobody's buying it. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but, go, go with the mascara thing. That would be. Yeah. That, right. Stick with mascara cops. There you go. Keep yeah, the wife no, happy. No, no. That's all it does. Uh, now that's, she's that's like, a... that printer was a good idea. I actually printed out knobs for my oven not too long ago, too. Oh, so, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. The The fun part I... was originally my wife's like, yeah, you know, I think we, it would be cool if we had some some blue knobs, you know, like some fancy color. I'm like, all right. So I'd order this paint and this, you know, primer and all this other crap and like, you know, obviously it takes a while to like design them and get them all like right so everything fits or whatever. And so then I like do a test paint on one to just kind of give her like the idea, like, okay, you want to see what this looks like? And, and, and all this time I've been like printing them out just in black and just sticking them on the, the oven to like, okay, yeah, that looks, oh, that's not deep enough or that's, that's not working right when you push it in or whatever. Right. And, uh, I, I paint the one and she's like, I kind of just like the black ones. Yeah. I'm like, really? <laughs> I so so you want me to paint those? And she's like, I actually don't even care. Like, cause standing two feet away, you can't tell it's printed. And I'm like, yeah, all right, well, here you go. I, I think the, the cool thing about the PLA that I like is that you can change the, the, the filament that you're using. Yeah. And you can buy different colors and you can easily swap it out with yeah. the resin. I have a vat. So if I have to change color, if I want to use a different color resin, 
I have to pour the resin back into the mob into the bottle. I have to clean the vat and then, you know, then put the new that's resin in and that sort of stuff. And, and then you print out of that. And if you want to go back to the old resin, you gotta, it's such a nightmare of a process. It's just not, yeah. you know, it's, that's definitely yeah. an advantage kind of thing, but yeah, the PLA. I'm forgetting the name. I think it's like FDM printer or something like that. Is that what it is? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So you can change the the materials too. Like with those knobs, I used a like a PC blend because it had a higher um, temperature rating or something like that. But sure. yeah, it's really cool. It's really like there was a, an idea that I had originally that I wanted to build this thing. And that was really as far as my my thought process went with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And then once I had one, it really just it just changes the way that that I look at pretty much everything in my life. I'm like, oh, I can make that, or like, you know, when you're you're dreaming up something, you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. I'm just yeah, you know, I'll just make one real quick. You know, well, you know, like the full suspension bike that we're working on, kind of thing. We're we're printing out the because we're doing everything in CAD. We're printing out like, all right, let's you know, I, I need to see how this, you know, the suspension actually works kind of thing. Like let's yeah. mock it up and you literally print the stuff out and it's like, okay, this works or it doesn't work kind of thing. This fits or it doesn't fit. And it's, yeah. it's, it's so cool that you can just do that at, you know, the drop of a hat kind of thing. Like, Oh, yeah. print. there you go. We're good to go. Or an engineer works on it. I, my, my, my main engineer for this project lives in Whistler. So, um, you know, so we're, we're constantly on the phone and emailing back and forth and he sends me a file and I could just print it out here. Like, it's yeah. not like I need to go to his office or anything like that, or, you know, yeah. it's just, it's so simple to be able to do that. And it's just, yeah, I could print it out and, and he sends me the file. It's as fast as an email. And I have a print in hand in an hour yeah. that, okay, let's, let's talk again in an hour and a half or whatever. And yeah. There I'm looking at the print, like, all right, let's change this. He makes the change and he sends me a new file. And it's like, yeah. it's, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely revolutionized what you can do, what the possibilities are. I mean, I think there's something to be said for like actually seeing something in, in like physically as well. You yeah. know, I, at least for me, like in my design process, like in, in front of fusion, I can design something and it looks perfect, right. you know, and then you print it and you're like, that doesn't work the way that it looked on the screen you know? right. <laughs> so uh I, I i'm sure that's cool and then i mean like for something like what we were talking about earlier you could print the bottom bracket and the yoke and then actually you know mount a crank set to it and be like oh yeah that's that's definitely enough you know There's this looks good okay. you know like this will yeah. work yeah so. exactly you can make the measurements for where you need them to be and yeah. You know, I mean, like we, we even put in, uh, because we have two, our, we have two different gravel yokes, you know, for different size chain rings and, and tire mm -hmm. clearances. We even wrote on the inside of the yoke. So it's on the inside. One says, uh, G the letter G and the other says G. And then it has a little plus sign kind of thing. Just so you can just see what it is. And it's just, that's just printed in there. Like, it's not yeah. like you have to sit there and go, all right, well, we sorted them. This is the gravel batch and this this is the gravel batch and this is the gravel plus batch. And, oh, we accidentally mixed them up. It's like, you can just yeah. grab it and just look and see like, oh, yeah, yeah I know what that is kind of thing. Like you can make all those marks and, and all that sort of stuff. And and like, yeah. it's, you just think of the ideas, like anything you can think of, you can do. I mean, we, yeah. our dropouts, we put the owl on the back of the dropouts kind of thing. So if you look at the back of our 3D dropouts, there's an owl that's, embossed uh i guess it's reverse embossed so it's embedded in the in the dropout kind of thing like that's right. just, just kind of cool like it's just yeah. little touches you can do that you couldn't do machining you know yeah it'd be impossible to do so yeah yeah it's really really interesting um it, it I, i'm sure that it changes a lot for you guys compared to things that you did you know when you first started yeah yeah, it opens up, it just opens up the, everything you've dreamed about, it allows you to at least try. Yeah. Whether or not yeah. those things can actually work or not is a different story, but right. it allows you to at least try and to really push the bounds of your creativity. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what you think a bike can do and what you want it to be and, and that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, you can get into, 
you know, structures, you can get into organic style structures where, you know, you can have the computer can actually take out excess material and you can have it, it can look like a, a web, you know, I've seen bikes that look like a spider web concept yeah. thing and it's just, but it's structurally sound, you know, yeah. it, it looks weird, but it's structurally sound kind of thing. And it's just, there's so much you can do. It's just, yeah. You know, It'll be to the point. Do you think, do you think you're going to see stuff like that, you know, hit the market in the future with the way that 3D printing will change like manufacturing? I don't know. Or do you think um, it's a gimmick? No, I don't think it's a gimmick. I think there's definitely something to it. Um, I, I mean, we do it on some of our parts. Our dropouts are, it's called shelling. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an outside skin. So it looks solid on the outside, but the inside, there's actually a very fine lattice work of, right. of a structure internal of the part. So the walls of the part are super thin, but the the lattice work on the inside is, is there to support the piece. So it's structurally sound. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think from an aesthetic point of view, I think that's going to be harder for consumers to, um, to uh, uh, get behind kind of thing. I think to mm -hmm. some extent, they kind of still want some of the traditional, you know, look and feel of a bike. So I don't see that spider web concept being um, uh, something that's going to catch fire. There's going to be people yeah. that want it for sure, but I don't think it's going to be the majority of the market. Um, but that ability to print like that, like you could build a square tubed, um titanium bicycle frame and yes. print it instead of like having to bend stuff you know yes and yes. you could put you support that. in in like spots that you wouldn't it be like even more stiff or less like you could almost shape titanium in a way that you could do carbon right now <laughs> yes you can do that and um uh, that i do believe is that i believe is coming i my vision of the future is that you're going to call me up one day and go, hey, I want a large size, you know, all mountain enduro hardtail uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go, great. I'm going to and I'm just going to literally hit a print button. Yeah, and it's going to hit print. And the, the entire frame is going to come out as one piece kind of thing. Yeah. It's just it's just done. Or maybe it's two pieces and it's just split in the middle and. I've got a guy, he just welds it together in the middle and yeah, you're done kind of thing. Um, that's where I see 3D printing going, that it's going to be as um, as the 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 technology gets better, the prices are going to come down that you're already starting to get metal printers that you can buy for home use. Uh, yeah. They can't do titanium, but you can do, you can print carbon fiber um, at home now. You can print... I believe you can do steel and aluminum. I think that's crazy. Um, you know, I mean, these printers are still like these printers are like eight to ten thousand dollars, and yeah. you still need. There's a printer. There's a machine for sintering. There's still a machine for you know. There, there's still yeah. There's still a lot to it, but there's it's going to get there. It, it's going to get there to like the microwave stage where it's like, yep, just push the exactly. button. You yeah, that, that's literally it. I mean, think about where we were when microwaves first came out, how big they were kind of thing. Or, yeah. you know, for those of us that are old enough to remember uh, Betamax and yeah. VHS kind of thing. They're, those For the kids out there, they were, we had, we watched video on tape. And yes. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so it was just, you know. To, and you used to be able to rent one at 7-Eleven. Oh yeah, there was, there was a chain. It was called Blockbuster, and they had stores all across the country. And you would go in and you would pick a tape. And if they were out of the tape, then that was it. You couldn't get it anywhere else. Kind well, of thing. thanks to Oregon, you still have the last Blockbuster, right? It's, it's that, not in that is true. There is one Blockbuster <laughs> left. Uh, that is very true. Uh, they're holding on for dear life. But now it's like now it's you. You think about it from where it was to now. It's literally you can watch movies on your phone. Yeah. You know, and That's it's crazy. just and it's the entire blockbuster category and library of all these major companies is literally on your phone or you can access yeah. it in some way. Yeah. So the, as the technology comes down, the 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 printing capabilities are going to increase and you're going to be able to start to print more easily. And then it could yeah. be a case of you can if you want the bike, it could even get to the point that if you're ordering a large bike, you're just buying the file from me 
because yeah. you have a printer at home and I you're just printing it out on your own. And yeah. like I feel like it's gonna get that way with like Amazon and stuff like that, where it'll be like, Yeah, I need some plastic forks today and we're gonna have a picnic, and it's like, okay, I bought them and boop, you know, two hours later, there's my 50 forks yeah. that I needed. You know? yeah. Yeah, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if that's if that's that would be the that would be the wave. That's where I see it going. It's yeah, just gonna definitely. be more more mainstream and and you know mass produced for consumers kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. it's coming. It's coming. Well, man, it's been two hours. And so Holy cow, that flew by. It always goes by quickly. Um, where do you, before we take off? What where do you see what's your what's your future with Sage? What what, what do you want to see happen? <sighs> Um, I want to, um, cash out in two years and move <laughs> to a small island in the Pacific, um, where I am going to be king. There you go. Maybe emperor. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and, and that, and that's kind of, yeah. And, and I'm going to have this awesome mountain bike and it's just going to be mountain bike trails on the island kind of thing. <laughs> No, so nothing. Else. One big mountain. Okay. One, one big mountain. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it be a volcano. I mean, that's okay, but you know, um, you know, that that's you know, it keeps it, it keeps it real. Uh no, I um where do where do I see things going? I don't, you know, I, I see us continuing to uh to grow and expand, uh continuing to get the name out there, you know, is you know, it's still I still believe in, you know, uh we're we're fighting every day to get our name out there kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, I'm, I'm always playing like it's, we're 10 points down. We're not 10 points ahead. So it's yeah. just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And when you stop pushing, then it's like, wait, then you've kind of lost a step. Yeah. Um, but I, I, spot, I, like, is there a size where you're like, that's really a, that's all I want. You know, like if I was making 5,000 bikes a year, that would be, I don't think I want to get bigger than that, you know, or is it like, do yeah, you, you want to be like the, the trek of titanium. No, I don't want to be the Trek of Titanium. I, I would be happy if I were doing a thousand bikes a year. I mean, that would be like, that would be absolutely killer and, and, and that sort of stuff. That would be, yeah. um, that, that would be great. Definitely not there right now. And that's fine kind of thing. Yeah. I'm happy with where things are and I could see, I would definitely, I want to see more growth and I definitely want to do things, yeah. to continue expanding the brand. And, but yeah, if we got up to a thousand frames, that'd be, that'd be pretty comfortable. And you know, right on man. Yeah. Keep it, keep it, keep it rolling. Just as long as I'm having fun, that's kind of yeah. the important thing. Like, you know, as long as I, as, as long as I keep loving doing what I'm doing, then I'm going to keep doing it. And even if we're doing the thousand bikes a year, it's, you know, if I still love it, I'm not giving yeah. it up. So, yeah. I always ask people what uh, YouTube channels they like to watch, whether it has anything to do with biking or not. Sometimes there's some, some gems that come out. You got anything lately that's been catching your eye? Oh God. Okay. So we all know the YouTube algorithms like to just keep, you know, giving you certain things. So the things that have been my, my algorithm, there is a website called ocean liner designs. Okay. And it's this guy, uh, I'm blanking on his name and like, I'm a, I'm a big old Titanic buff nerd yeah. kind of thing. And so he's done a whole bunch of videos on the Titanic and just other ships. It's not actually, it's, but it's about ocean liners kind of thing uh -huh. about, you know, the big ships and all that sort of stuff. So uh, he's, it's actually really good. It's informative stuff kind of thing. Yeah. Well, well done. And, and so he, he's got a good channel. So I've been watching that. Uh, that usually pops up quite a bit. Um, oh God. What else? Um, there's the, you know, the usual mountain bike videos and, and, and that sort of stuff, but yeah, ocean liner designs, um it's funny you mentioned the uh island in the pacific i actually like i don't know if the algorithm's now predicting the future but it showed me a video earlier today about this kid that went to this island in the solomon islands some little tiny island out in the pacific yeah. that um that there's no money there like everybody just like works and does their own part for their their like sure. community and that's it it was just interesting. It was like when you were explaining, I was like, I watched a video about this place. <laughs> I, uh, not too far off. I mean, that's, you know. Um, they just didn't know. have mountain biking yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd say, yeah, it's it's usually I'm trying to think what's in my YouTube feed. Can I can I look at my YouTube feed really quick? Is that going to screw anything up? You can look real quick. I'll let you look. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> Those of you guys that are listening, oh, still. Form- okay, I got Formula One stuff, and I got go. uh, Ocean Liner Designs, and then a lot of 90s sitcoms. Oh, there you go. 90s sitcoms. So Frasier, uh, uh, Friends, Seinfeld. Yeah. Um, and, if you uh, haven't watched Alf years. since you were a kid, you should watch it again because it's pretty funny as an adult. Really? Okay. Yeah, All yeah. Right. I, 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 I went back and, and watched it. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, but no. Anyway. Uh, yeah, no. So that, that's that's kind of my, that's my YouTube feed. Yeah, Formula One, 90 sitcoms, and Ocean Liner Designs. Sweet. Thanks, thanks so much for sitting down and chatting with me and and, and all the uh, the biker bar fans and patrons or whatever you want to call them. I, I need to come up with a name for them other than uh, the listeners, the, the viewers. I don't know, whatever it is. We really appreciate you taking the time. Gang? If you're a biker yeah. bar, who goes to a biker bar? Gang, a biker gang, gang. yeah, the, the gang. Right there, you go. Now, now we got it. This guy's full of it, man. He's got names like Sage and and the Biker Gang. <laughs> Anyways, really appreciate you sitting down and chatting with us. It was super fun, man. Honestly, Thanks, every Rob. every uh, every time I sit down and do one of these, it's it's always a, a good time. So somebody says the biker bar flies. That's great too. <laughs> Anyways, um, those of you that are listening on a podcast app, especially especially um, maybe if you're listening on Apple and you write me a five star review, I would be super stoked. I just pulled this up while we were talking earlier in Kim Cork on April Fools. I don't know if this is a joke. Maybe it is. She says, or he, I guess that's either way. Great MTB info from YouTube creators. Unlike other really long podcast. This one speeds by because Robert is such an easygoing guy at the bar. <laughs> Conversation list. <laughs> I have learned a ton about the lives and efforts of MTB creators. Thanks a lot for writing a review. If you think that you have something like that in you, do me the favor. If you're thinking like three or four stars, definitely don't waste the time. You got better things to do with your life. <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to check out Dave's website, uh, the Sage Bicycles website. It, the link is in show more if you're on YouTube or if you're watching uh, on a podcast app. There's a link right down there in the show notes. So you can hit that. Go over to take a look. Check out what he's doing. And uh, if you're thinking about getting something custom, reach out to him. If you're if you're um, if you're in that that titanium kind of spirit. Otherwise, if you guys want something for free, just remember this: it only takes a bike to be a biker. Get out and be one. <laughs>